This was funded by the good people on patreon.com slash alpha j show. Life begins after school. That's when we bend all the rules. Time to hang with all my friends. We like to be together in a place where we belong. I'm 16, 16. Gotta make the good times last. Sixteen was an incredible show at its time. Of the whole teenager aspect animated shows, this one always stuck out to me as being the one that I enjoy quite possibly the most. Of the mid to late 2000s, I feel like Sixteen gets heavily underappreciated, especially with the great run that it had. Going for six years, it has produced 93 22-minute episodes, and also went on for four seasons, carrying fresh TV, Teletoon, and Canadian animation as a whole to create well-produced entertainment that anyone can enjoy. So obviously, Obviously, the question remains, what happened? Well, we're not there yet. Nick's got a brand new show about 16 working at the mall. This is great TV! It's called 16. I have to see this. And there's only one place you'll find it. Oh, I'm so cute! On Turbo Nick. So to expand on 16, bringing Teletoon and Fresh TV among others forward to great success, I feel like it's only appropriate to talk about Canadian animation as a whole, at least up to this point. Of the companies that revolves around Canada, I want to focus on the three that really had their hands in 16 the most. Teletoon, Nelvana, and Fresh TV. I don't like your math, buddy. Come to think of it, I don't like math at all. And manatees, why are they smiling all the time? In 2004, Teletoon was already off its feet. After being licensed by the CRTC, or the Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunications Commission eight years ago, to many American viewers, you would most likely know of Teletoon through its partnership with Cartoon Network, airing many Cartoon Network series as well as Canadian original animated series. Around this time, it would have aired shows like Totally Spies, Braceface, Clone High, among others. In fact, it's kind of crazy the output that Teletoon had compared to other networks, quality aside. Hell, this network originally aired Caillou. Yes, Caillou. I say all of this to say that Teletoon was busy. Why? Well, their goal was to quote, produce 78 half hours of original content every year. Because to get their license, it came with a clause that they were quote, required a gradual increase in the portion of Canadian programming on the schedule by about 5% each year, starting from 40% in its first year of operation to 60% by 2002. In simple terms, they had to air things from Canada, considering that they're a Canadian television network. Which leads us into why they would air so much new content every year, even if it didn't stick. Now, Novana is a different beast altogether. They've been around since the 70s, starting out as an underground filmmaking project. Since then, they've turned from a project started in an apartment to being brought out by one of the biggest media companies in Canada. Now, to be clear, while Teletoon is a TV channel, Novana deals more in the making of animation, carrying the first five seasons of Fairly Odd Parents, Cyber Chase, Max and Ruby, among also many, many others. They've formed the Canadian based Glue, as far as bringing other shows to Canada. They have distributed shows that were made in America to all over Canada. Novada has had its hands in many areas, serving as both the maker and distributor. And 16 would be one of the original shows, and by original I mean not based off a franchise. Now for Fresh TV, I'll be honest, there doesn't seem to be much about it that I can find. They were founded in November of 2004, and this is the first show they made, but that's about it. I didn't know much about it, so I had to call my expert, YouTuber and big Fresh TV fan, Noah. So Noah, tell us more about Fresh TV. Right. 
Fresh TV is a company that is often overlooked. When the thoughts of a Canadian animated show are pondered, most give credit to the network Teletoon itself without looking at the actual companies that produce these inspirational masterpieces. And as Jay mentioned before, Canada has produced some amazing shows throughout the years, but did you know that Doozer and Lord Miller Productions produced the hit show Clone High? Or that the innovative world of Totally Spies was brought to life by the likeness of Marathon Media? I'm gonna go all in here and say you probably didn't know that, but if you did, then hell yeah bro, here's a gold sticker. In all seriousness though, these companies are overlooked far too often, so without further ado, let's shine some light on the minds behind the award winning company known as Fresh TV. The first person I want to talk about is Tom McGillis. Now Tom is somebody that I've actually had the pleasure of talking to, and although him and I do disagree on the current state of total drama, he has done some incredible things that would be a shame to go unnoticed. Back in 2004, Tom McGillis decided to create the company known as Fresh TV, and without wasting any time, Tom decided to introduce a cult phenomenon to the world in the form of a group of teenagers who like to chill at the mall. Now Tom is actually still the current president of Fresh TV, which is really nice to see. He's sticking with his company and I dig that. Tom is often credited for creating the hit show 16, Backstage, Garage Band, My Babysitter's a Vampire, Stoked, and of course my personal favorite, Total Drama. Thanks again for that bro. But seriously, they even made a freaking zombie movie man. It is a legit movie about campers getting infected by zombies. It's the straight dude of the living dead meets Total Drama crossover in real life that we didn't know we needed, but we're really glad we got. Now these are all iconic projects, but I don't want to give Tom all the credit here. It's time to talk about his right hand man, or in this case woman, she's Jennifer Perch. Jennifer is an Emmy nominated writer, producer, and series creator, and like Tom, has been with Fresh TV since the very start. And she has also been a key factor in the creation of every hit Fresh TV show, including Total Drama 16. But for the most part, what can be said about Tom can be said about Jennifer, and what can be said about Jennifer can be said about Tom. And that's an iconic dynamic that more companies should strive to have. Now these two started together back in 2004, and 15 years later they're still going strong, that's pretty awesome. And now that we've talked a little about the amazing work these two have done, it's time to throw it back to Jay and take a closer look on one of Tom and Jim's most influential and critically acclaimed works, 16. Thanks Noah, and please check them out after you finish watching this and don't worry I'll remind you again at the end of the video. It's clear that the paths these three companies would take led to this very creation, 16, an animated sitcom about six teenagers trying to figure out their lives within a giant mall full of drama, romance, and tons and tons of comedy. We'd see, take this job and squeeze it, the pilot episode of 16. on my spring shopping. I do this every year. Oh, I know. Pink is back in and my closet is totally pink poor. Good thing the mall's open early on Saturdays. It starts off with Caitlin and Trisha, best friends who plan to shop around the mall. The one thing you would know about 16 is that the mall is a very big part of it. It's like underwater with SpongeBob. It'd be weird not to see it. They start off with a quick joke about spitting and it's yellowish. Gross. We'd also get a few subtle introductions to characters like this gentleman here. Very aloof and getting into easily avoidable situations, he debuts in the show by getting caught in a clearly avoidable trap. Another thing the show does, like a sitcom, is that it introduces you into the episode with a comedic or dramatic skit, then plays its intro, then gets into the meat of the episode. It's clear that this was written to be like a 22 minute sitcom, with drama at certain points and cliffhangers at others. So we meet Jonesy and Nikki, two who will be very important to talk about later. Jonesy is a very laid back but arrogant fellow and serves as the joker of the group, often getting into situations he doesn't need to because of how much he acts out. It becomes a running joke within the series that he gets fired or quits a job per episode, as his lack of commitment is a flaw for him. It's not just jobs, but also relationships with women, as while he's a huge fan of flirting and dating, he doesn't seem to have many steady romantic relationships. Or does he? You know, you're gonna have to find someone dumb enough to hire you first, right? Look at me, do I look worried? Uh, not really, no. Hey! Nikki, on the other hand, is not one to act out, but rather to snark and verbally snipe people very calmly. Often viewed as pessimistic and cynical, she's a self-described punk rock chick, whose rebellious nature sets her apart from the group quite significantly. They meet up with Wyatt and Jen, other members of the core group. Wyatt is a relaxed, straight man of the group, whose caffeine addiction, strong music opinions, and frequent refusal to get into the mess of Jonesy's plans sets him apart as the mature male of the group in some aspects. Speaking of mature, Jen would be the mature female of the group, being very motherly, responsible, and generally the one rah-rahing the group to actually get off their butt. Can I help you? 
A lychee fruit smoothie with an energy blast and no pulp, please. We only have what's on the menu. Oh, uh, I guess I'll have a lemonade then. Do you know where nice cinnamon buns is? Oh, it's just over there. Make sure you ask for one with a hole in it. They're like so much better. Thanks. Do note at this point, no one in the group is friends with Caitlyn. She's built up to be a rich kid who never worked hard for anything, and thus her lack of self-awareness to the world is apparent. The girls of the group make it very clear they don't support Caitlyn and what she represents. Luckily, she wouldn't be rich enough to buy her problems away for too long, as her subplot would revolve around her buying too much, which leads into her maxing out her credit card. She's so spoiled. She's like this only child and both her parents are doctors or something. Why should she work when she's rich? I wouldn't. The others would be trying to find at least a job so they can spend time all together in the mall during the summer. But back to Caitlyn. What they're saying about her is mostly true. She doesn't have any self-awareness, not even knowing where money comes from. It leads into her not having money at all. You want me to what? I have to get a job? <gasps> My cord! All right, all right. You came behind her with the scissors a little too ready. Don't trust this girl after an argument. She will scissor man your wrist if you're not cautious. But in all seriousness, this is a very important scene because it establishes the journey that Caitlyn will take. She has to understand the value of money and pay her dues by getting a job to pay back the debt that she had no idea about. It leads into her character making a significant change over the series and avoids a serious roadblock in making her an unlikable person and for many of us an unrelatable character. As with the other archetypes sticking closely to their label in many cases for the first half of the season. Season. Like imagine if Caitlyn were to stick with the snooty rich character. That would have been a disaster. Now you're probably wondering, okay, six teens. Caitlyn, Jonesy, Nikki, Wyatt, and Jen. That's five. I saved Jude for last mainly because the episode introduces him quite late. A meta but also in-story statement of his character. Of all the people in 16, Jude is the most laid back. Being what you'd imagine a dude to be. He's all about breaks, skateboarding, extreme sports, and just being a bro. You can tell based off of his applications being covered in what he ate last night, exactly the character type the staff was going for. Aside from the responsible Jen, they all last minute their preparations for getting a job at the mall. So where's everyone going to start? Travel agencies. The Gigantoplex. Free movies. North Shore Surf and Skate. Definitely. Grind me. Excuse me? The coffee house? I like the clientele. They're civilized. <laughs> Oh, we'll get to the risky jokes very, very soon. But guess what happens when you don't prepare? Well, they don't get jobs, obviously, except Jen, which causes a panic. I love the interview scene, and it works well for a point I wanted to segue into, the animation and art style. This was all done in Toon Boom Harmony, a 2D animation software, which because it was digital and didn't require trace lines, it led into the show having an art style that doesn't have outlines, which clearly distinguished it. Even in hindsight, if you were to look at other Canadian animated shows, shows, the use of thick outlines seems to be a popular trend. Not only that, but the show being made in 2004 makes this scene have a lot more sense. It tried to do the whole montage part really well, but I was way too distracted with the lack of, well, a background. I know you see this here, but this would have benefited more with a much better representation of what we're supposed to see, not these partial drawings. Granted, this could have been for a stylistic reason, but still. They all snark at each other, with Nikki taking a very harsh stance against Caitlyn, who actually takes all of this on the chin. In the meantime, we also get introduced to many side characters, whether verbally or on screen, like the mall security guard, who doesn't like any teenagers and takes his job very seriously, almost too seriously. Because Jen is responsible, she gives her job to Caitlyn. J just a minute, sir. That's what I said. But he was like, fine, just don't call me. And I was like, I so wasn't even going to? No thanks, I'm good. Right, as if he's so not my type. And as you can see, she needs a huge readjustment to get any good at her job. She fails at every aspect, trying to get out of work every time, and she basically makes Jen's job harder. I do like how they spend the first few episodes really nailing the point home that Caitlyn is heavily wired to essentially avoid her new life, and it will take time for her to understand the nuances of being a self-made person who doesn't rely on their parents' income. It takes work. Trisha. Over here! Isn't it a little early to be shopping for Halloween costumes? <laughs> I'm gonna prove to daddy that I can earn my own money. I already know how to make juice! <gasps> ah! Um, I don't think we should hang out anymore, Kate. What? You're wearing a lemon hat, Kate. 
And polyester. Sorry. I don't get it. She was my best friend for like a whole year. And it's with this, we get Trisha breaking off a pretty vapid friendship with her best bud, Caitlyn. I really want to nail the point home that this episode does a great job with Caitlyn in particular. She gets slapped by the real world quite brutally. Even though each character gets a bit of limelight, it's a smart move to have the one that's not a part of the original group highlighted the most. Jen would go on to blow up at her at the end, but it was a well-needed talk that leads into Caitlyn vouching for her in front of Jen's new boss, who initially perceived the situation as Jen being a jerk and nothing like her interview. It gives Jen a reason to not be so harsh on Caitlyn, unlike Nikki, who would spend much of this episode and the next shading Caitlyn. And that leads into her official introduction into the group. They end on bonding over watching what Nikki's new job is, the khaki barn, which is filled with the clothes, people, and mentality opposite of a rebellious punk rocker chick. And that was the first episode of 16. With such a great first episode, it's clear that the show is set off to be a success, with many episodes to come. So, let's talk about The Rise. If we are to get into the rise, we must split it up between each character. 16 either works or doesn't work for you because of the main characters who you see and grow with throughout the show. So take this as a broad character review as well. Although you can say this for any of the crew, I feel like Jen is the true glue for the crew. If it wasn't for her, then the others would fight over everything and not take a stand for important things. Her level of responsibility and selflessness really does come into play within many episodes. And I feel like one of the best episodes to either highlight or introduce you to Jen is One Quiet Day. It's midterms and everyone is freaking out, as relatable as that may be for many of you watching. Besides Jen, no one is really in the mood for studying for midterms and would just rather cushion the blow of failing. Now let's try chapter seven. Uh, back it up there, teacher's pet. I'm still working on chapter five. Yeah, slow down. I told you guys you should have started sooner. She really tries to wrangle the crew together. As besides maybe Wyatt, they go through lengths to escape the study session. In fact, Jew ditches the crew altogether to quote study, when in reality he was just ditching the ditch. In many episodes, she's considered the mother. And what made me often enjoy her personality is that we often needed that character to steer the other characters into action, or at least the right direction. Although she didn't provide much of the comedy within the group, her warmth and tolerance for others provided a lot of wholesomeness to the show, giving us a ton of learning moments with the others, especially the boys. Although I should note that when she's at work with her coach, it's a completely different deal. However, like with many characters, there seems to be episodes where they flip the script on the character and this here is no different. Here, after bossing around her friends a little too hard because of the stress and pressure, Jonesy makes a bet that she cannot last until closing time without bossing her friends around and pushing her advice on them. So because a good and honest battle would be boring, the story gets more entertaining as the crew go out of their way to bluff and pretend to do something that they really shouldn't do, or in reality things that Jen would disapprove of, to make her crack and it doesn't work too well. You should do whatever you want to do. <laughs> That's what I thought too. Caitlin, you're- Huh? Did you say something? Uh-uh. Okay, -uh. bye! Wish me luck! I think this episode does a really good job at portraying the self-awareness of exactly what makes Jen tick. Guess what? We've decided we're both gonna get tattoos. Today. Bluffing! Bluff, bluff, bluffy blah! This becomes a major point of the story, as both of them go into the tattoo parlor extremely confident that the other will crack, causing the other person to win the bet. The stakes are high, as tattoos are permanent, which makes them a great choice. Jen's not cracking. What do we do? What do we do? Okay, here we go. This is uh, gonna sting a bit. <gasps> Stop! You'll never forgive yourself if you get the wrong one. I knew it! I knew you couldn't keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Okay, okay, I lose the bet. To be completely fair, guys, you guys would be pretty terrible to go through with a tattoo for five bucks. You would not be able to be justifiably mad at something that you had the free will to break. Jen does understand that sometimes she pushes advice a little too strong and tries in the future to let the crew solve their own problems, releasing a little bit of that motherly grip on them. It's a fun little introduction episode to her character that gives a good look on how she'd be throughout a lot of the series. So let's move on to Jonesy. Thank you. 
Jonesy, being one of the original members of the gang, is considered the joker of the group. Quite full of himself, his daily life at the mall consists of getting jobs and getting fired and trying to pick up girls, and not getting anywhere with either of his two goals. Those two traits make up a lot of his outer shell. While it has been proven in many episodes that he does care for his friends, that doesn't stop his near obsessive need to be a ladies man, which almost always doesn't work. So to show you an episode that deals with these qualities, I introduce to you a lime to party. Hola, senorita. Jonesy, <laughs> what are you doing there? This is my new gig. I've got a solid feeling about this one. This is amazing. Now we get to hang together all day. So Jonesy gets into one of his most successful jobs, both yet and in the entire series, the party lime. Unfortunately, he runs this new store so well that it nearly drives Caitlyn out of business. Like many teenagers, especially in media, Jonesy is no stranger to putting his own interests before others, even if that means to others' detriment. In fact, in a later episode I talk about Snowjob, it takes him three-fourths of the episode to understand why dating the popular but extremely shallow girl from school who is only using you to get back at her boyfriend is wrong. And that was a pretty long episode. There is a side of him that wants to live the shallow life. However, his friends do keep him grounded. That isn't to say that he is the only one who causes mayhem in the group, it is often him and Jude who tear up them all together with their rebelliousness and lack of respect for authority. However, when the pressure is put on Jonesy, it's clear he would crack. When are you coming over to shake what your mamas gave you? You don't get it, do you? What? This lemon's going down! This calls for a change of plans. No lemons are leaving this mall if I have anything to do with it. I will rock this giant fruit so hard that I will get the lime kicked out of the mall first. I was probably gonna get fired anyway. Might as well go out with a parte. Today is the day for this mall to parte! Free drinks for every party line customer! Like in this episode, Jonesy would intentionally get fired because he doesn't want Caitlyn to relocate. A lot of people would bring up that since they're in a giant mall, Jonesy should have just kept his job. That was giving him lots of popularity, lots of cash, but also the approval of a lot of women. And Caitlyn could just get another job at some other spot in the mall. However, when we get to the Caitlyn section, you'd learn that the lemon doubles up as both a place to stay, but also in addition to being a job, as there isn't any other place in the mall that would willingly allow six teenagers to essentially loiter around without paying for anything. That type of selfless behavior really brings Jonesy into being a very good character. In my experience, I never questioned why they were friends with him because it makes sense. He does care, even if it takes a lot to get that out of him. And he does nice things a lot more than he's given credit for, even if there is shallow tendencies in him. So yes, he does party himself out of a job, but for the greater good of his friends, which shows a nicer side of him that you may not see in many episodes. But it counts here quite a lot. It's a great episode, and it highlights Jonesy's personality amazingly. So let's get to his good friend Jude. Jude is the dude. A lot of people recognize this voice from being the same voice actor of Chris McLean from Total Drama. Christian Potenza. His super laid back attitude makes him one of the more calmer friends of the group. However, with his lack of responsibility, flakiness, and large tendency to steer people away from work, it doesn't conclude to being a mature person. He is super nice and helpful, and it does lead into him being aloof in many areas, including romance. For example, he would break up with Star only because Jonesy, someone who he trusts fully, jokes about him essentially being on a leash in a later episode that I'll talk about. However, the best episode to highlight Jude is the Lords of Malltown. Jude doesn't really have that many censored episodes, surprisingly, giving his popularity among 16 fans. He does appear a lot, and I would even go as far as to say as much as the others, but often his role is to bounce off of someone else's plot, particularly the B-plot, with his personality. So of the few, this episode has them teach Wyatt how to skateboard, because of Wyatt's uptight and dull behavior post breakup. This wouldn't be the first time Jude was involved in helping his friends out due to romance. You'd have him teaching Jen how to drive in one episode to impress a guy who works as a bus driver, and then also again going on a fake date with Jen in order to make the new co-worker jealous. I picked this episode because of all of these episodes, this one just has the nicest result. I've fallen into a rut and I can't get out, you're the only one who can help me. Bro, I can offer you freedom from your rut. I can introduce you to the inner world of the skater. If 
you're ready for it. His attitude towards going with the flow does get him into trouble and people hurt. Like here when Wyatt, someone who doesn't know how to skateboard, is learning how to relax and skateboard through Jude, being pushed to grind the escalator as his first task. Like in the slow and even tempered, he is prone to not really explaining things well to rational people. People who think logically and not emotionally. So it generally comes off as not enough information for people like Wyatt and Jen too often. Now while his good intentions make up for his aloofness, he does get into trouble more than one would normally because of the fact that he never thinks for the long term. In fact, in the Jen episode, he initially was going to flunk because he never truly considered studying harder with his friends that would support him. And later on in the Nikki episode, he would get banned from the mall because of his reckless behavior. He's not the type of person to get a hint. In this episode, it takes Wyatt falling down the escalator and crashing into a potted plant for Jude to understand that he would need privacy in order to learn how to skate. Since skating is his passion, he is a better teacher here than with driving. He does get white out of a rut and makes them feel better. It's a very sweet episode, and also just a wholesome counterpart to the main plot, which was Jen getting placed on a double date that she really doesn't want to go on. Jude may be unreliable when it comes to work and not really that fun responsibilities, but when you need someone who would cheer you up like no other, Jude's your dude. Now, let's move on to Caitlyn. Caitlyn would go on to be the only person not an original member of the group. However, her presence within the show would not be hindered. Originally a clueless, spoiled rich girl, her lack of a credit card forced her to prove that she can make money on her own, which leads into her building a character more than just a shallow shopper. She would go on to develop humility, kindness, and just a sense of empathy in many situations that she was portrayed in the beginning of the first episode to not have, if the people she hung out with were any clue. Speaking of, a great episode that deals with that is Losing Your Lemon. Is that what I think it is? Yes! I got my credit card back. I thought your dad took your card away when you maxed it out. He did, but as of yesterday's paycheck, I paid him back. So as the first episode would show, Caitlyn was in debt to her father. This episode has her pay her debt in full, going on to be able to use a credit card under the assumption that now she has worked for money, so she'd be financially competent with a credit card. They really play up in the beginning of this episode that Caitlyn has paid her dues and promises to be more responsible this time. It does make her friends look pretty bad, as Caitlyn goes the more logical route, saying that she would be an idiot to repeat the same mistake that landed her in a lemon hat for a year. However, player two has entered the game. Caitlin, there you are. Who, me? Come on, just pretend you're with us. But you remember Gwen and Mandy. Yeah, hi. I thought you hated me. Okay, maybe I've been a bit of a cow, but that doesn't mean we can't still be friends. And I've got the skinny on three other secret sales today. <laughs> Caitlyn's old friend who ghosted her when she didn't have a credit card. Now that she does, she manipulates Caitlyn into spending a lot of money. Now when you think about Caitlyn, she was a clueless, spoiled, rich girl. But now she's a clueless, hardworking girl of the people. With that, you can see why it's easy to manipulate her. This also shows the ugly side of Trisha, going as far as to find doppelgangers to take up the space of where Caitlyn used to work, so it drives the original crew to struggle to find a spot for themselves. This is why Caitlyn working at her job was so crucial to the crew. Not only that, but Trisha does this as a way to drive a wedge between her friends and her, by making them essentially have to fight for their friend, hiding and taking Caitlyn's credit card so that she doesn't regress back into her old ways. If there's one thing that should go without being said, is that Caitlyn loves shopping like a lot. Well, shopping and boys, both of which are always on her mind, at least once per episode. So when you take the battle between Trisha and her friends, you get this. Your shopping is out of control. We're all worried about you. Come on guys, I'm fine. And guess who little miss I'm fine was shopping with at the khaki barn? Trisha. And now that chick and her crew have hijacked our lemon. She what? They autographed the table and everything. She never even mentioned it. Wow, I had no idea my shopping affected so many people. She decides to willingly, even though she is no longer in debt, work for her money and not max out her credit card and buy out stores like Trisha, sticking with their friends. If anything, it was clear that she did not need to do that. She could have left them as soon as she didn't need to rely on them. Also to have Nikki, the one who took the longest to warm up to Caitlyn, being the one who pulls her aside, shows some serious development. This is a great Caitlyn-based episode and you guys should definitely check 
this out if you're looking for a great introduction to her character. But let's move on to Wyatt. <laughs> The calm, cool, and collected Wyatt serves as a male straight man of the group. He's often very relaxed and calculated in many areas. However, a big focus in this show is two things, music and his attraction to girls who are into music. With both of these elements, he is shown to be incredibly shy and not confident in himself at all, often relying on his friends to help him out. He is also addicted to caffeine. Now his episode is interesting because of many, many factors, but focusing on him, here is his highlight episode. Idle time at the mall. We get to see Wyatt's dedication to music pay off, getting a chance to be picked up by a major record label. He begs his friends to go so that he looks better in comparison, which while that sounds pretty mean, they don't take it personally, mutually agreeing that they, not Wyatt, suck musically. What I often enjoy about Wyatt is that like Jonesy, he is kind of two-faced but in a good way. He often shows a very calm and slightly cynical outside, but he's a very anxious individual when it comes to the things that he cares about the most, and isn't willing to show that side of him unless it benefits him. Who knows what the future's gonna bring? I'll tell you one thing, I can depend on my friends for everything, no matter where or when, through anything, right till the end, I can depend on my friends. He's pretty talented when it comes to music, and has strong musical opinions, like his hatred of country music. However, he took it on the chin when it came to running the country music section, with the option of being promoted in the future. It showed his dedication to getting a job to spend time with his friends. So within this episode, he gets to open for a pretty popular band, and he feels most confident when his friends are near. So you can probably expect exactly what happens when he starts. Where is everybody? I don't believe this! None of my friends showed up! Thanks a lot, guys. Time for some new lyrics. Jonesy really is a jerk. Hits on anything in a skirt. Jude thinks he's a dude. He doesn't have a clue. Caitlin wears a giant lemon. Thinks the shopping mall is heaven. And Jen, she's just plain rude! Nikki thinks she's tough. She can't even wake up. None of you were there for me. You suck. Now to explain, Nikki is tired because Wyatt kept her up all night working on the song that he'd eventually sing to win the audition. Jonesy was outside selling memorabilia of Wyatt, Jude in this episode was on a currency kick where he plans to change the currency of money to more of a barter system, and Caitlyn was stopped by a 50% off sale and dragged Jen along. Now this episode does a lot of things wrong, so Wyatt makes a big deal that no one was there during his big moment, and granted Nikki was sleeping, but put it within the context of Nikki staying up all night for Wyatt, who is used to coffee. If anything, he should be more grateful that Nikki did this for him, or there should have been a bigger reason to be mad at Nikki. Caitlyn and Jonesy I completely understand because the former has no excuse, and the latter is trying to make a buck off you, which might I add, you took a part in so that hurt your justification there, but Jude is the most egregious of all the people to be mad at. Tonight, I get to open for Utility Pool. Sweet. <gasps> They're awesome! And I got you all front row tickets. So if Jude has front row tickets, then he shouldn't be stopped at the front door because of his currency. That completely ruins the concept of front row tickets. If you reserve seats for him at the front provided they pay, that's fine. It's a stretch, but it's fine. But you clearly said you got everyone front row tickets. So his part literally makes no sense. He switches up the song too. Guaranteed to get you hopping. Need some clothes, they'll take you shopping. Or hang out just like this? Oh yeah. What are you doing? That's the wrong version! No, it's the right one. Now of course, when a big money record label executive does come over to hear his new song, he sings the nicer song, which I suppose is supposed to be his way of saying sorry to his friends. I don't buy it, not at all. Even Jude in this episode questions why he didn't go for the record label contract. Overall, it does show Wyatt to sacrifice things for his friends, and there are other Wyatt episodes around, but I felt like this highlighted a lot of what I think of Wyatt as a character. Last but not least, Nikki.
If you want to know the wisecracking, cynical, tell you how she really feels about you person of the group, that's Nikki. Your punk rocker chick who works at an ultra happy girly store that annoys her every day, she's a big part of the group. She was the last person to really warm up to Caitlyn. She's often in the middle of dumb but entertaining drama, and her wisecracks are pretty good. She has quite a bit of maturity like Jen, but with the laid back, near apathetic attitude like Jude, and strikes a well balanced medium. There were many episodes that highlighted Nikki, but I decided to go with the one that ties up what 16 is all about, Snowjob. Like when I talked about fish hooks as fish prom, Snowjob is about a winter dance, inversely. You see, when you think about the introverted, cynical, sarcastic type, do you think the shallow, arrogant ladies man is going to mix with that type? Well, surprisingly they do. Sometimes. Kind of. In a way. Yes, Jonesy and Nikki dated twice. The first time was well teased with many occasions showing Nikki has a warmer side, at least to Jonesy, and more that she leads on. They would however end it in unhappy anniversary because as you see, they were very reluctant in dating because they feared it getting in the way of their friendship with mutual friends. Nikki getting back to being a single Pringle would go on a date once. And this happened before Snowjob. And now that she's single once more, more, she's not into dances anyway. My band's playing a set. Awesome. Sweet. It's so cool that your mom drives the preschool bus, dude. Eee! We're gonna have fun. I know. Eee! Eee! Wake me when it's over. This entire episode revolves around each of the crew's struggles. Wyatt's shyness with women, Caitlyn's extremely awkwardness with men, Jen trying to set up the entire prom and everything crumbles beneath her, and Jude finding a person who drives a Zamboni and getting way too attached. However, the one that we'll be focusing on, obviously, is Nikki, but to an extent, Jonesy as well, as Nikki only on the outside doesn't want to go to the dance. It's quite clear that her arrogant attitude really makes her step on her own opportunities, which does humanize her character a little bit, giving her the benefit of not always being a snark. However, due to Jonesy's aloofness, he never picks up on the hint that she doesn't appreciate hearing about him getting or failing to get dates based off of his shallow perspective, especially considering that they split recently. In fact, one of the very few positive moments they share together before the dance is when Jonesy actually focuses on Nikki, rather than using Nikki as a stand-in for Jude or someone else to talk about women with. Come on, you can do it. I promise I'll hold on to you the entire time. Plus, you could use the exercise. <laughs> bite me. Ah! <laughs> Don't worry, I won't let go of you. See, it's not that hard. Huh? Oh, I'm skating! Woohoo! Go, Nikki! She's so still hung up on him. Oh, I know! That's it, you're doing great. Keep going. Tara! Uh, uh, oh. Oh. Ah! Ouch! I am psyched to report that Tara Johansson did recognize me from the hockey team. Congratulations, All-Star. Ah! Oh. Wow, you really can't skate. Ah. You said you wouldn't let me go. Hey! Stop. However, again, due to Jonesy's personality not being 100% to any woman, he tends to mess things up again. It actually speaks highly of Jonesy that Nikki does know this, and she's 100% self-aware of his womanizing behavior, but she decides to ignore that side of Jonesy, rationalizing it in other ways. She is, in a sense, willing to be hurt by Jonesy. And you know, I want to dive into this topic a little bit further. Maybe if I, um, maybe if I, uh, uh, you know, go deeply into my female side, I could probably explain this a little better. Just give me a second. I, I haven't done this on camera before or, or microphone. <sighs> That's much better. I'm Alpha Jane of the Alpha Jane Show, and let's talk relationships. There are good ones, there are bad ones, and there are complicated ones. As teenagers, they betray themselves at not knowing what they want in all aspects of their lives. So with Nikki, she's still open to the idea of being with Jonesy, but Jonesy is still open to the idea of not being tied down just yet. Even though it would be a pretty stable relationship with someone whom he knows well, he doesn't fully know this just yet, and would much rather score while he can. This is why when he would go on to date one of the most popular girls in school, no one in the friend group approves of this, as it's seen as Jonesy getting ahead of himself and getting into relationships that won't last. However, to give slack to Jonesy, like Jude, he's always been the type of person to need to experience why something is wrong to... 
understand why it's wrong. And luckily, the episode doesn't end with him staying with the shallow, vapid, popular girl who's only using Jonesy to get back at her ex. What Jonesy thinks he wants and what he actually wants are two different things. What he enjoys in Nikki is the attention that she gives him even if quite a bit of it is sarcastic and cynical. What Nikki enjoys in Jonesy is also that quote acting outside of him. It would prove to be the longest relationship in 16. I hope you guys see what I see in them, which is a steady, stable relationship that ends up not destroying the friend circle. Now, let me see if I can switch back. Have I got an on button for this or... Ah, oh, there we go. So Nikki gives up her spot at the dance to give it to one of the khaki girls. Mind you, she does not like the khaki girls, but she does it when Jen gets her hair messed up and needs their help to fix it. We broke up. I miss him so much. Jonesy, why are you talking to the taco girl? She's okay. You don't need a time machine. If you want her back, just go to the dance and tell her how you feel. You really think she'll take me back? Definitely. This leads into Jonesy finally figuring out exactly what he wants. Nikki, you're the only girl I want to go out with. So I'm asking you. <sighs> yes. And righting his wrongs. And for a show like this, these scenes are very needed. It's not a primarily comedic, wacky, off the wall show. It's an animated sitcom focusing on teen life. So it works perfectly. They do dance and it really does encapsulate the feel of 16. It gives us a nice ending with quite a few talks that needed to happen. These characters are amazing and without them, 16 would not be the same. They're funny, they're layered, they're well distinguished. So if the characters are good and the episodes are well done and the show feels a void that not many other shows did at the time, what happened? Well, let's talk about The Fall. I posted a clip on Twitter about a joke that I don't remember seeing from 16 when I was younger. I get to work. Whatever you say, ass man. That's assistant manager. I could fire you for that, you know. <laughs> Your name tag says ass man. Now this is because I didn't see it when I was younger. 16's content at times was deemed too risky in the United States compared to Canada's more relaxed system. This led into scenes and sometimes episodes not airing in the US at all. In fact, at the time of recording and making of this video, 16 is the only show that I could not buy on iTunes when I needed to purchase episodes to make a video. 16 digitally is not only available there, only in Canada from what it seems. Now yes, there are other avenues to get 16, in fact it is free on this service that you see on the screen and in the card there is a playlist full of 16 videos it does in hindsight make sense why 16 was passed around so much it was made for canada and a lot of what it said and did would not fly in the u.s when you compare other canadian animated shows like total drama and johnny tess they had a lot more success because they weren't as risky Total Drama did have some things censored of course, but the entire first season, its most popular season, has aired in the US. It's hard to break out when the systems in place prevent you from getting in. Now remember earlier in the video when I said the mall is what made 16 16? Now originally I said that 16 being in the mall, the entire show just revolving around that place, is what made 16 16. But it could have been a curse in disguise. It's plausible. There was only so much you can do in a giant mall, the other places could have done as well. Yes, they would venture out beyond the mall, but rarely. I can look back to Ed and Nettie as a great example of this. Rather than staying in the cul-de-sac for every episode, they ventured out into including their school in episodes. It could have been possible that 16 takes a route and that includes maybe school, maybe their homes, but it could have been too late. People today still debate if the move to school was a good idea for the Eds. Maybe the move could have hurt 16 in the long term. I definitely see the argument of them staying in the mall being limiting. Even even though I personally enjoyed it, I can't deny the fact that there is a lot of potential seeing them in school. Even though I personally enjoyed it as it is, it just revolving around the mall in 99% of the episodes, I can't deny that there is a lot of potential in seeing them in school. In fact, if you ask a lot of 16 fans, they wouldn't mind if they did something like 18 in college. That is a very popular suggestion, and it would have just kept the theme of a young person's life just adjusted to college. Maybe they just didn't have so much to offer outside of the mall after a few seasons, and ending it before it gets really bad is generally the way to go. The last thing I can contribute to the fall of 16 is actually the success of another fresh TV show. Life 
backs and we bend all the rules In a place where we belong I'm 16, starting to find my way Got a new job, gonna start at the mall today Total Drama would come out 2007 in the middle of 16's run. However, that show would go on to perform leaps and bounds better than 16. Now, of course, there are hundreds, possibly thousands of variables that go into that. Maybe it was the timing or the writing or CN's mood towards the show, but I can make a pretty good argument that Total Drama is more popular than 16, if you put all the quality arguments aside. Not only that, but considering that Teletoon and Fresh TV's line of animation isn't really that well known or well liked, for Total Drama and 16, to rise from them as the breakout stars that have built a legacy and a fan base, you'd be certain that people would compare the two quite heavily. Now, I don't like to get into these conversations personally, I know what series I do, that's different, you uncultured swine, but 16 and Total Drama have overlapping lanes. Both shows essentially appealed to the same group of people, and since one was already in mid stride and the other came out the gate swinging, getting a larger fan base in the process, it was quite clear who would eventually get the reboot. I suppose the only thing left to talk Talk about is the finale, a two-part special called Bye Bye Nikki. It revolves around Nikki's parents getting a job up north, forcing Nikki to move. What job is worth moving your whole family? Ah, don't even use the M word. Move. I said quit it. My dad's in the running to become the new vice president of Ruts. What? Wow. No. That's amazing. I love how her friends go from being extremely sad, freaking out at the near mention of moving, to fawning over the job that Nikki's dad is going for. It should be said that Nikki's parents are extreme workaholics and strict. It's the only reason why Nikki is so against work and authority, if you know how common this archetype generally goes. Of course, everyone here takes the news seriously, except for Jonesy. One best bud is moving away. But the Jonesmeister is here to stay. How come you're not upset about Nikki leaving? Guess I'm not the emotional type. I'm more like the strong and silent type. Except for the silent part. And the strong part. The episode does focus on Jonesy more because as both the best friend and boyfriend of Nikki, his reaction to her moving should be devastating. But it's not because, you see, he's going through the seven stages of anguish. He skipped panic and he's on to the second stage, denial. It's against his character to freak out about something, at least like this in public. As we've seen in many episodes, he believes heavily in his reputation, even if other people around him don't. Like I've said in the Jonesy part, he still sees himself as a flirt flirtatious ladies man, who on the surface may say that he will celebrate his independence, he feels for Nikki. It's just an amazing scene. The other side plot that goes on within this episode is that Jude, chasing after a burrito, loses his keys and is locked out for the weekend. As you can see, they went for a very light subplot, and I'm not being sarcastic. Even though the plot doesn't really go anywhere except Jude bumming spots to sleep and relax, I would much rather a plot like this than a plot that takes away from the drama and importance of Nikki moving away. In the meantime, Jonesy goes to barter. What for you? What for your sweetie? Both are for me, my fair Julie, so how about you give me two tacos for the price of one? Come on, be a pal. Can I at least get some extra hot sauce? Great! And some more jalapenos? Refried beans. Double cheese? A few extra onions. Guilt. Here I am enjoying myself while Nikki goes through this move all alone? What am I? A monster? And anger. <laughs> One thing that is really simple that fans appreciate is when the finale involves more characters than less. To see minor characters being used in the finale really gives the episode a bigger impact, as fans get to see them one last time, and not last used like 40 episodes ago. Although the main cast made 16 work, the mall wouldn't be the mall without a lot of the minor characters. The Rena cop, the annoying kid with his mom, the model guys who work at Albatross and Finch, Everyone in the mall with their differences. That is what makes 16 work. It's exactly how I feel. Tied up in knots while a kung fu master beats me with a really hard stick. Shh. Depression. Oh. And would you look at the time? That is stage six, depression. The last stage is acceptance. And he swears that he will not reach this stage and would much rather fight for Nikki to stay. The episode does a good job in showing the different pairs of people talking through this. We see Jude and Jonesy, Caitlin and Wyatt, Nikki and Wyatt, Jen and Nikki, Nikki and Jonesy, and they're all memorable to me. So after thinking through the ideas to get Nikki to stay, we get to the next step. Nikki bunking with Jen for seemingly the rest of the school year under the illusion that Nikki and Jonesy are breaking up. Because you see, Jen and Jonesy live together because his dad and her mom are together. Would you you stop harping on me to get a job. Get a job? Uh, did you better in school or we're through? 
I deserve a winner. Well, then I'm all wrong for you. I'm a total loser. Wait. You're right. We are so over. Love ya. Yeah, me too. That was perfect. Nothing about that could have made it better. I just love how their improv made it look like he was a loser and his arrogant side was getting super confused within the improv for a second. There's also the part where they play switcheroo with Nikki's dad's final interview. Jonesy, now as Nikki's dad, will switch roles and go to the final interview in hopes of trashing it. Jude would switch as the interviewer, the boss of the new job, and interview Nikki's dad, getting him to not like the job that he's being interviewed for. That way Nikki's dad wouldn't even want the job and his supposed future boss wouldn't even want to hire him both fail for obvious but hilarious reasons kids should be banned from our retail outlets they're like wild dogs shedding and drooling everywhere that'll attract a higher wage earning clientele and richer customers equal greater profits seriously you like that idea there's something truly awful about Jonesy playing as Nikki's dad, essentially calling for worse quality of life conditions around the workplace, and said boss loving the idea because of a higher profit. Weren't these shows written by the founders of Fresh TV? Thinking! Jude also fails because Nikki's dad is a skater, which leads into him hiring Nikki's dad after being impressed there. Their last call is Nikki bunking with Jen, but that doesn't work because the lack of space for Nikki to be her own person and well... <laughs> Knocking? Conflict of interest, let's put it nicely. Before we get to the big going away party, I want to go over two things that are very rewarding. Firstly, Nikki quits the khaki barrel on her own terms. It's funny to see her give a speech about how they suck, and how they're robots, and how they try to be cool, and that individualism rocks, and then see those same triplets give Nikki a very happy goodbye at the end. I guess they recorded this before Nikki quit? I hope they don't feel too bad about that. The other part we get is a heart-to-heart -heart moment with Ron, the mall cop, and Jude, who explains to him in depth why he has to see Nikki one last time before he leaves. This could have ended terribly with Ron abiding by the law or the rules of the mall, but it's just a heartwarming way to let Jude off the hook. So they spent a large, large chunk of the last episode reminiscing about Nikki and just all the moments they shared together as a group. It's a pretty sad scene with a different version of the 16 intro. This is the part where it really sinks in that their crazy adventures as six 16 year old high schoolers trying to find the one, a steady job, and just figure out what they want to do with their lives is taking a massive shift now that Nikki is leaving. However, the show hooks you until the end because... We've just decided this shouldn't be a going away party. It should be a staying here party. What? 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 After all we've seen, we can't make you leave. But right when you were relieved and you think everything is going to be just fine. Wait, 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 guys. I'm sorry, but I, I can't do this. What? what? My folks have always sacrificed for me. Maybe it's time for me to grow up and make a sacrifice for them. And they are supportive of her. It is also just an incredible sacrifice to let her father get the job that he's always dreamed of. And they are supportive of her. It does mean a Nikki less life, but as long as they keep in touch, everything should be okay. It is also just an incredible sacrifice to let her father get the job that he's always dreamed of. It just goes with the theme of this episode, revolving around no one approaching Nikki and letting her talk and hearing her side. Her parents were initially going to move without her input, she had to leave because her friends were too sad to talk to her, and her boyfriend was in pure denial during most of the special. So to see her finally get an input and make the move, it was just a powerful scene. Well, although Nikki and Jonesy were going to split because they didn't feel like it was going to work, the show ends with them calling each other before Nikki flies out to get back together for the third and last time. And that's how 16 ends. The show would end February 11th, 2010, creating an almost six year run. I love this show and I can't wait to come this show in the future. If you're looking for a show that speaks to the confusing period of being a teen with relationship drama, tons of wacky characters, and just a time capsule of the mid 2000s, let these six teens entertain you. I'm Alpha J, and thank you for watching. Just a short tidbit before the end card, these videos take a lot of time, a lot of research, and a lot of work. Even though they look great now, they can look even better with your support. 
please consider supporting my Patreon. All of your money goes back into videos like these to make them look better. Plus there's different perks like behind the scenes videos, hot takes videos, and even getting your own personal review. So check it out, patreon.com slash alphajshow, it is in the description, it is in the pinned comment. If you enjoyed this video, please check out the entire 16 playlist, and also check out Noah. I'd recommend this video here to start out with this channel. Special thanks to the patrons of June, and until next time, take care. Alpha out.